Welcome back for part three here of the doubling examples for the doubling chapter. Uh, we've done uh, a bit with the clarinet and the flute. Let's do a little bit with the double reeds. I think we can maybe do both the double reeds in this segment. We won't drag it out so far. Motiv many of you will not be trying to play the double reeds, but in case you are, I want to just pass on a, a few thoughts to you. Uh, first of all, the reed needs to be adequately soaked. The entire wood part of the reed needs to be soaked by immersion in a cup like this or any other kind of cup, but it needs to be soaked fully. And really to get a good soak, we're talking eight to 10 minutes if it's completely dry. So I would give it plenty of time and I would have it completely soaked. I don't know if this reed's gonna do this right now, but the reed should, so should seal. Just like we sealed the mouthpiece, the reed on the mouthpiece. We got lucky on that one. Let's see if this one seals. No, a little bit. It's not a very long seal. It might be enough to, to do the demonstrations I want to do. I, I don't want to really take the time to, to try to fix that. But uh, let me put the reed in. The reed goes all the way into the stop. First, the embouchure. Uh, the embouchure is a vertical embouchure. I think of the bassoon and the oboe embouchure as vertical. So I'd, the first step in both embouchures is drop. Vertical. Open the teeth. Drop the jaw. Now, with the oboe, I'm going to put this, the reed in the center of the lip, red part of my lip, and I'm going to roll the, the lips in. And the double lip embouchure. I've got to have the lower lip go over the teeth and the upper lip go over the teeth. And the reason I do this from the tip like this is I want to control the amount of reed that goes in the mouth. I want the reed to be barely inside. If this is the mouth cavity, here are my lips, mouth cavity is back here. If this is the cavity, however you see this. I want the, re the, the uh, I want the reed to barely protrude past the lips inside, maybe a sixteenth of an inch at the most. It, it has to clear the lips or it won't vibrate, but if I want it to be barely just inside the lips, not way in like this, just barely inside. Now with the bassoon, that's the biggest difference, is we take the, the reed way into the mouth like this, almost the entire scrape part. Plus it's a little more open and dropped. but. Uh, also, the bassoon has a little bit more of an overbite like this, where the oboe is a little more of an even bite. So the angle of the oboe has to be a little more even. The bassoon comes up from the vocal, comes in about like this. Clarinets, underbite. Saxophones, more of an even bite. Oboe is almost even, slightly back, just a touch toward the clarinet. Bassoon is more the overbite like this, but not extreme. We don't want to leverage the blades against each other and choke them off. All right, so we're looking for the reed to just barely get inside the mouth. Biggest difference between the oboe and bassoon is that right there. As I form the embouchure, draw string closure, keep the jaw dropped. This would be really bad to play it like a vertical, like a horizontal embouchure. So I'm dropped, come in from the sides. I want to talk for a minute about the habitual sharpness problem on the oboe. You walk into a high school band room and the oboe is almost a quarter of a step sharp, or, the, or, or maybe a, also in an orchestra room, almost sharp. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> first problem can be that the embouchure is too <laughs> horizontal, more like clarinet. can also be the reed in the mouth, the amount of reed. I mean, check this out. How much the reed in the mouth affects pitch dramatically. We actually use that for tuning, but we don't want to have the reed slipping in the mouth too far when we don't want it there because that's going to make it sharp. So if I'm playing here, 
Now if I'm playing here, it's almost a half step higher if I got too much read in the mouth. <laughs> That's crazy. <clears throat> so we have to really be careful about too much read in the mouth and about having the homage too pinched and horizontal. If the throat is tight, <clears throat> this drives, drives pitch up as well. Uh, sometimes all these problems can be caused by just overblowing, trying to put too much air through the oboe. It doesn't accept very much air at a time, and if we're overpowering it, sometimes it'll, it'll push it up. Uh, the read length can be an issue. You want the read length to be correct. Uh, and I'll check that if there's a, a problem where we see that everything else seems to be working. I'll, or maybe before that, I'll definitely measure the read. Let me just uh, demonstrate a way of getting into the second register that uses, makes use of that amount of read in the mouth. Uh, most people, when they go to the upper register, it's like, and they're busting a blood vessel here to play high. This is a very bad approach, and it makes it go really sharp, thins it out, chokes it off. Now check this out. If I really do nothing, then it's flat. Then I just roll in enough to bring it up. In other words, I can get that upper note sounding, feeling just the same as the low note. Doesn't feel like I'm straining at it at all. Just feels like I'm still blowing the low note. And then I just put the reed a tiny bit more in the mouth. Just roll it in. Uh, <clears throat> and so here's one of the exercises that I have given in the, in the book that I think is so helpful. This is one of the major problems in getting the oboe is those, those upper notes. If you can make them feel like the lower notes, not only have you got better pitch, better tone, but you're going to have a lot better endurance. It won't wear you out so much. So, so check this out. Here's the exercise. And I'm using all the second octave key notes. And I'm not pinching it up. I'm not lipping it up. I'm not biting. I'm playing it exactly with the same embouchure as the low notes, except I'm rolling the reed in just slightly. So do that with all those second octave key notes, A, B flat, B, and C. That really helps to get the feel for the upper register. I think it's a great exercise. Uh, another thing I think that's critical to understand is the managing the air on the elbow. One of the keys to uh, feeling comfortable on the elbow is to keep your oxygen balance right in your bloodstream. And the elbow uses so little air that we can play a really long ways in one breath. It's just such a bad idea to take advantage of that unless we really need to once in a while. If you continue to take advantage of, of playing a long ways in one breath, you will soon wipe yourself out. <clears throat> Cells depend on good oxygen level to function with good energy. And when we, make them when we make cells function on a low oxygen level, we lose energy pretty fast. <clears throat> uh, we're going to get tired, in other words. So here are some things, some points that I would make about managing the oxygen level in your bloodstream. Well, let me make another point. <clears throat> I'm blowing. I'm not uh, using very much air. Pretty soon, I'm almost out of air. It seems like I've got to have a breath, but I'm still half full of air. Now, realize that when you take in a full breath of air, you're only getting about 22% of that that's oxygen. So I can be half full of air and feel like I'm out of air because the oxygen has been depleted out of the, out of the air supply. <laughs> this is a weird thing on the elbow. It's like <clears throat> being in the middle of the ocean with nothing to drink because I've got all that air, but there's nothing usable uh, th that I really need. All that oxygen is gone. So what I would do then, uh, well, okay, let me go through the scenario. Here's a scenario for, I think, how the air kind of works. We take a full breath. I got 22% oxygen. Now I'm half full of air, but I'm out of oxygen. My body is saying, I need a breath. So I take a breath. How much air did I get? I only got half a lung full. Well, that's 11% oxygen. I'm going to deplete that fairly quickly. And now I'm three-fourths full of air, but I'm out of, I'm out of oxygen. And so I feel like I've got to have a breath. My biological defense mechanism says, air! You've got to breathe. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I will take another breath. Now I only got like a fourth of the breath. 5.6% <laughs> oxygen or 55 
I'm gonna lose. I'm it's like. <laughs> I'm gonna pop. <clears throat> so what do we do about this? All right, number one, I've got to breathe frequently. Don't play a long ways in one breath, as I mentioned a minute ago, unless I really need to take advantage of that occasionally, but not normally. Second, we expel all the old air before we take in the new air. And the way we do that is we let all the air out through the nose while we're letting the embouchure disassemble. But I'm gonna keep the reed in that spot, center, center, tip of the reed in the center of the lower lip. <laughs> I let all the air out through the nose. I see I can turn it around faster if I let out through the nose and through the mouth. If I let out through the mouth and in through the mouth, <laughs> there's a little longer turnaround time as opposed to, <laughs> I can, I can turn around fairly quickly. I can let out the old air, take in new air, get a fresh breath of oxygen. <clears throat> it really helps if I can do that. I'm going on. <clears throat> if I can do that, that's going to help me stay more comfortable. It'll give me more endurance. I won't tire out so quickly. <clears throat> uh, uh, another thing that we do is when there's not time for letting out, and taking in, which I can do fairly quickly, then let's say that I'm going along and I, at the period in the sentence I let out and take in. But maybe I got a particularly long sentence. I don't want to play the whole thing in one breath. And so what I'll do is, uh, because at the end of that, if I do it in one breath, I'm still half full of oxygen. And I can't get a, a really good breath at the breath place. And so what I'll do at the comma in the line, I'll let air out and then I'll keep playing. I can let out a fair amount of air and still play to the end of the line because I use so little air. Then at the end, I can take in a full breath because I've actually run out of air, partly because I let the old air out. There have been different methods for this. Harold Gombert used to be the principal uh, oboist with the New York Phil. He actually would let out air through his nose while he played. It's noisy, but it would expel air at a more natural rate so that when he had a chance to breathe, he could get a full breath of oxygen. Uh, you can he actually hear that on some of the recordings. Uh, I think it's a little better if we can plan how to let out and in quickly, but sometimes we'll just let out, take in. Uh, there's other times when we have to plan very scientifically for this. I'm thinking of the Handel uh, second oboe sonata, second movement. It goes, Bum bum ba 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 bum 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 ba ba bum ba 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 da ba ba pi da ba 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 da ba ba pi da ba ba. And it goes a long time after that. I want to be oxygenated when I hit that. So I may go bum 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 ba da dum bum bum ba da dum ba 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 da ba ba pi da ba 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 da ba ba. So I'll let out, take in, let out, take in big. That way, I just at every little rest. So I may do several things in a row. Uh, the last thing that I might resort to, if I have a quick turn, have, I have no place where I can really let loose and let the old air out and in, <clears throat> I might go, I, I might, just to keep comfortable, I might sniff in a little air through the nose without interrupting the oxygen. Like that. Uh, fourth movement of that same Handel Sonata. Repeat. There's not time to really let out an end. By sniffing a little air through my nose at each one of those places, I'm going to be more comfortable uh, when I do the big repeat. Because <laughs> I'm going to get, by that time, I'll get a full breath. So. <clears throat> there's different things that we do, but we have to be pretty scientific about this on the oboe if we're going to last through the whole piece and not have our head dropping off. I just want to mention two fingerings that we have to know if we're playing the oboe that you need to be aware of. Uh, because we can slide on the oboe. We'll slide from one little finger key or, you know, we'll do some slides. We never slide on the clarinet. We can do some slides here, but there are two slides that we will never consider doing. And the first is anything that involves my, th my third finger here sliding to that spatula just above it. So if I have to go to D to, from a D to an F, let me, come, let me bring this down a little bit and you can see this.
you might get okay, might make it sliding up, but you'll never be able to slide back down. The sliding does not work there. And so what do we do? <clears throat> we use what's called the fork tap. So I'm playing, if I'm playing from a D to an F, I just lift my middle finger. That's the fork fingering. First finger of each hand, uh, first and third finger, I'm sorry. The fork fingering, I lift my middle finger, there I am. Now this needs a resonator. And on my elbow, I have an automatic resonator. As soon as I lift, can you see that moving? Yeah, as soon as I lift my middle finger, that little hole opens. On the full conservatory system, we have that uh, as an automatic key. On a cheaper oboe, you may not have that key. There may be nothing there. An odd thing about double reeds is they make them cheaper by leaving half the keys off. That's true for oboe and bassoon. The cheaper instruments don't have all the keys. This is the full conservatory system, we call it. The, the bassoon system is the full heckle system. Now, the full conservatory system then says I have that automatic resonator, but what if I don't? Well, it turns out the automatic resonator is right there. The E-flat pad is right there. They're directly across from each other. I can simulate it by adding the E-flat key. So if I have an oboe that doesn't have the automatic resonator, I've got to add this for a resonator, uh, just to be aware. You may get a better oboe later, and then you've got to learn not to do that because you don't want two resonators. <laughs> but that forked F avoids this. And if I'm coming from a C to an F? No. Uh, in that case, I'd have to go over to the left E flat we're going to talk about in just a second. Uh, <clears throat> but anything that would involve that slide, we don't do it. Now this oboe on the full conservatory system, I have another key over here on the left. This key is actually moving that same spatula key down here that I would have to play for F natural. I can punch it, I can push it from the other side. A lot of oboes don't have this, this full system does. So I could go D to F with the left F and not have to go to that F and go to it on the left side. It's really nice if you have that. I don't, you don't have to always use it just because you have it, but sometimes it makes it really nice. The other slide that I never do is if I'm sliding from this, this is the D-flat key or C-sharp key here in the middle. If I've got to go from D-flat to E-flat, we just don't do that one. And so the D-flat can only be played here, but the E-flat has a, a left side, a right side, and a left side. It's the inside most key over here. That is the same as the outside most key over here. Oddly enough, the one key that doesn't have an alternate on the opposite side on the clarinet is the E flat. And the one key that does on the oboe is the E flat. Uh, so we have to get used to, <clears throat> uh, uh, if we're in a, this happens if we're in four flats or more, or four sharps or more, where I've got either D flat to E flat, D flat, sorry, D flat here to E flat over here, or uh, C sharp here to D sharp over here. So if I'm playing E major, ba da di ha da, E C sharp on the right, D sharp on the left, and then to E. If I'm playing the A flat scale, A flat, B flat, C, D flat on the right, E flat on the left, to forked F in the scale to G A flat. So there, there's a there's two fingerings that you really have to know if you're going to uh, be a serious oboe player. You cannot slide on those things. It just doesn't work. You're jarring. You don't have a hold of this like you do on the clarinet or the saxophone. It's going to easily be jarred in the mouth and you have to do things that keep it from jarring. So just to review then on the oboe embouchure, I've got drop, tip of the reed in the middle of the lips, the lower lip, and then roll the lips over both teeth. Reassert the drop as I draw in the draw clo drawstring closure. Vertical kind of embouchure. I think we didn't talk about the angle before. Well, yes, we did. Did we? Uh, the angle, uh, if you angle too much either direction, you're going to leverage the reed blades against each other. Check this out. I've leveraged it off. <sighs> leveraged it off. So I want to find the best spot in there. Somewhere here. It's going to be out a lot more than the clarinet. Clarinet's going to be head up, clarinet in. This is going to be more, more out. Uh, but you got to find the best spot for it. The bassoon, on the other hand, is going to be an underbite. I mean an overbite. The clarinet's the underbite. Anyway, 
we'll talk about more of that. Uh, the uh, the bassoon is nearly the same embouchure as the oboe. Uh, it's the double lip, it's the drop jaw, the teeth are open, it's the round closure. The main difference is how much reads in the mouth. With the oboe, we barely have the reed past the lips, and with the bassoon, we're putting in most of it. Plus, I may be dropped a bit more, maybe a little more open. The whole embouchure may just be a little bigger on the bassoon. Oboe, a little more, a little smaller. But other than that, the only real difference is the amount of reed that's in the mouth. So let me switch to the bassoon and we'll, uh, we'll demonstrate some things on the bassoon about the reed and uh, ways of developing the sound. Okay, thank you. We'll be back in just a second with the bassoon. <laughs> 